Thank you so much, David, for this opportunity. Um, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides? Perfect, thank you. Um, and thanks to you and Marty and the board and everyone for taking time out of the day. It's an honor to be able to speak with you today. The topic I will be discussing is vast and nuanced, and I can't possibly do it justice um, in, in this time, but my moderate, my modest goal is to provide a hopefully useful overview. This figure is from Leah Bustan and Bob Margo's chapter on racial differences in health, a long run perspective, and shows life expectancy at birth from 1900 to 2010. The dark line represents black or non-white groups, and the gray line represents the white group. All groups have dramatically increased life expectancy over time, yet there was not a single point in which black or non-white life expectancy equaled or surpassed that of the white group. Note that at the beginning of the period, life expectancy at birth was estimated using data from death registration areas, or DRAs. Bustargo note that since the DRAs initially focused on urban areas where the mortality penalty was higher, life expectancy at the beginning of the time period was likely substantially underestimated. Hence, they focus on the Preston and Haynes estimates, these triangles, which indicate that there was a smaller nine-year gap between white, white and black Americans at the beginning of the period. The size of the gap initially is important since it informs how much convergence has occurred. The Preston Haynes estimates support a less dramatic convergence from nine to four years. Many participants in the oh. meeting. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, great. Um, from nine to four years over the 110 year period, then the DRA series. It's also interesting to think about what political, economic, and medical phenomena were occurring that might give rise to the pattern seen in this figure. For instance, here we can clearly see the 1918 flu pandemic, which had profound effects on both age groups. According to Bustan and Margot, the most rapid improvements in Black life expectancy occurred between 1940 and 1960, corresponding to a period of rising real incomes and quote, racial convergence in both income and educational attainment. Although black and white life expectancies have gradually converged over time, there have been periods of stagnation and even reversal. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic has erased at least 15 years worth of progress, closing the black white life expectancy gap. This figure is from the National Vital Statistics Report released in February showing that while life expectancy declined sharply for all Americans, the burden was not equal. Life expectancy for non-Hispanic Black men declined a full three years from 71.3 to 68.3 years, followed in order by Hispanic males with a decline of 2.4 years from 79 to 76.6, followed by non-Hispanic Black females with a decline of 2.3 years Hispanic females, and then non-Hispanic white males and non-Hispanic white females. The disproportionate impact of this pandemic on Black, Hispanic, and not shown here, but certainly in other data, Native American communities underscored the continued vulnerability of certain groups. How do the disciplines of medicine and economics explain these persistent health gradients punctuated by periods of convergence and divergence. In this talk, I'll first discuss conceptualizations of race and economics and medicine, primarily focusing on black versus white differences. Next, we will discuss historical connections to current challenges. Last, I'll talk about diversity in the professions and potential avenues for future research. Throughout history, professional economists and medical doctors have developed scientific explanations for understanding differences across groups. Explanations for racial differences in health outcomes in medicine historically centered around the role of biology and later genetics. An analog in the history of economics would perhaps be the overarching role of preferences. 
So as we will see, prominent economists often appeal to biological differences directly through their support of eugenics. In terms of characterizing and sometimes perpetuating racial bias, the fields have different approaches. Bias often plays out in clinical medicine through the use of algorithms for diagnosis, treatment, and referrals. An analog in economics could be the models we commonly use to understand discrimination, which provide an incomplete account of the concept. To understand why biological and preference-based explanations for racial differences continue to hold sway, it can be helpful to review the discourse in the formative years of both professions. We begin with medicine. A prominent example in the 19th century of using biological differences to justify unequal treatment, even slavery itself, was Dr. Samuel Cartwright. Cartwright has been described as, quote, a scholar fluent in several languages, including Greek, Hebrew, German, and Latin. He was a practitioner widely known and respected throughout the South, eventually becoming the Assistant Surgeon General under Jefferson Davis. One of his tasks included chairing a commission that reported to the State Medical Society on diseases particular to the Negro. The final product seen here entitled, quote, a report on the disease and physical peculiarities of the Negro race, emphasized, quote, anatomical and physiological differences between the Negro and the white man that were often hyperbolic, if not completely fabricated. In this report, black people were compared to children unable to take care of themselves, and these differences were used as justification for continued bondage. To give a sense of how social inequities were pathologized, here are two examples from the commission's report. First, they describe a condition known as drapedomania, which was a supposed mental illness which caused afflicted in enslaved individuals to want to escape. Another illness described in the report was dysthesia ethiopica, which caused individuals who were black to quote, create disturbances without cause and made them quote, insensible to pain. For both of these supposed conditions, the treatment was whipping. And such torture caused actual mental and physical health issues for black Americans who were enslaved. Medicine's discussion of race has evolved in the past century. The narrative, however, that there is something biologically inherent in race classification that directly affects health outcomes continues to strongly shape the practice of medicine today. A recent essay in the New England Journal of Medicine reviewed over a dozen widely used clinical algorithms that race adjust. These algorithms are used to assess the need for chest surgery, the risk for heart failure, breast cancer, et cetera. One example in how race plays a role is in the measure of kidney function. If you've received labs recently, you might notice an estimated glomerular filtration rate or EGFR that is a calculation based on your serum creatinine. This calculation is incredibly important as it is a proxy for kidney function used to dose medications as well as determine eligibility for a kidney specialist or transplant. For years, the calculation for black people led to them having a higher GFR for the same creatinine based on the notion that they were perhaps more muscular. The consequences of this is that the decision for recommending a renal transplant for black patients occurs later than for white patients with the same blood creatinine measure. Another example is vaginal birth after cesarean or VBAC algorithm, which predicts the risk posed by a trial of labor for someone who has previously undergone a cesarean section. It predicts a lower likelihood of success for anyone identified as African-American or Hispanic. In each instance, the explicit use of race in these algorithms almost invariably makes minority patients with similar lab or clinical findings less likely to receive screening, close surveillance, referrals, or interventions if they are Black or Hispanic. A seminal paper by Ziad Obermeyer and Sanjil Balanithan found that a widely used commercial algorithm developed to predict clinical risk exhibited significant bias, even when excluding race, because it was based on prior healthcare costs, which are also unequal. 
perhaps because some of the decisions on when to spend money or see a specialist are based on these biased clinical tools. As the Nijim authors write, these explicit race adjustments, quote, risk baking inequity into the system. But as we have seen, even if we don't race adjust explicitly, there is still a potential concern. Medicine was not the only field which liberally ascribed racial disparities to genetics or preferences, or the latter often based on the former. The early history of economics in the United States is replete with such examples. A Journal of Economic Perspectives article by Thomas Leonard details the pervasive influence of the eugenic ideas during the formative years of the economics profession. As Leonard recounts, a substantial share of American Economic Association or AEA leaders were deeply involved in the eugenics movement. Leading figures in the discipline, such as Edward A. Ross and founding president of the AEA, Francis Walker, blamed the disadvantaged circumstances of Black Americans and many immigrants on poor genetics and capabilities, advocating sterilization and other measures to avoid dysgenic breeding that would dampen national prosperity. Walker attested that to eliminate poverty in the country, quote, a wholesome surgery and cautery must be enforced to, quote, strain out of the blood of the race more of the taint inherited from a bad and vicious past. These views spanned into the 1930s when William Z. Ripley, author of the most influential racial taxonomy book of the era, served as AA president. Although Ripley had become more known for his work on labor and railways by that time, one of his most famous contributions was a book written around the turn of the century called The Races of Europe. This book mainly discussed differences within Europeans, defining three different races and using, among other measures, the cephalic index to distinguish them. Ripley's work serves as an important reminder of the fact that the concept of race itself is largely a social construct that changes rapidly over time, rather than a slow moving evolutionary process. Indeed, if this were 120 years ago, the same title of this talk on racial health inequality might be the pretext for our discussion on the differences between Ripley's Mediterranean versus Alpine European races. Eugenics and race science became associated with Nazism and lost popularity following World War II. Moving into the mid 20th century, economics began to embrace preferences as cause for differences. In the midst of the civil rights movement, George Stigler, president of the AEA in 1964, penned an article in the New Guard magazine in 1965, contending that while black Americans indeed had suffered prejudice, this was not the principal cause of their disadvantage. Rather, quote, no amount of restitution for past injustice could solve the basic problem of the Negro, that on average, he lacks a desire to improve himself and a willingness to discipline. And further, quote, the Negro is excluded from more occupations by his own inferiority as a worker, again, on average. Stigler went on to argue that many whites do not want black neighbors, not because they are prejudiced, but because black Americans on average our bad, neighbor, our bad neighbors, quote, a loose, morally lax group. In short, the principal drivers of racial disparities, according to Stigler, was that Black Americans' exogenous preferences drove group differences on average, a word he used four times in this short essay. Turning to models, Gary Becker's taste-based approach and Phelps's statistical discrimination and its later refinements still dominate our profession. While both are insightful, they are also incomplete pictures of why racial disparities exist. First, both of these models are from the vantage point of the majority group. Under taste-based discrimination, majority individuals have a preference to hire or be served by their own group members. This stands in sharp contrast to important contributions by David Williams and his colleagues in public health who measure discrimination from the perspective of the disadvantaged through their everyday discrimination scale and major experiences of discrimination. Statistical discrimination, a non-preference-based model, starts with different distributions of a trait for majority versus minority groups and incomplete information, 
The initial version proposed by Phelps assumed that averages did objectively differ across groups. Subsequent versions allowed the variance of the trait to differ in one group versus the other, or the signal to be noisier in the minority group. Although most now interpret differences in distributions to be subjective rather than objective, we still lack an accepted model for what sustains these implicit or explicit biases. Now, of course, there is the argument that discrimination should be outcompeted in the market, since hiring according to taste or mistaken beliefs is costly, unbiased decision makers will overtake the biased ones. Clearly, this has not happened. So again, we need to understand what sustains these biases as well as consider the special features of the healthcare market and the doctor-patient relationship in particular. In sum, economics has mostly focused on modeling the tastes of the discriminator and his interpretation of signals at the cost of modeling how discrimination affects those discriminated against and the origin and stubborn persistence of prejudiced beliefs. A particular concern with models we use is the underlying assumptions that race is exogenous. As William Spriggs, professor at Howard University penned in an open letter to the economics profession following the murder of George Floyd, quote, economists are viewed as the objective scientists, presumably absent passion. But if you start with a model that has race as exogenous, racial differences cannot be objectively approached. The model begins with a fallacy that assumes racial differences as a natural order, unquote. In addition, the standard models generally omit the role institutions, culture, and their interactions may have in giving rise to the unequal distribution of attributes themselves. In a recent Journal of Economics Perspectives piece, sociologists Mario Small and Deval Pager write, quote, a substantial body of evidence suggests that limiting the study of discrimination to the actions of potentially prejudiced individuals dramatically understates the extent to which people experience discrimination, the extent to which discrimination may account for social inequality, and the extent to which discrimination may play a role in markets for labor, credit, and housing, as well as in other contexts. Recently, researchers across fields have been working to shift our understanding of race. This slide is adapted from Dr. Chandra Jackson of the NIH, summarizing recent work from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, or NASM's Roundtable on the Promotion of Health Equity. It is also informed by an article by David Williams and colleagues in the an Annual Review of Public Health entitled Racism in Health. In this slide, we see a recognition that race is not the risk factor for differential health outcomes across groups. Race is defined as the social interpretation of one's phenotype, nationality, or ethnicity, and serves as a proxy for relative disadvantage or advantage. Racism, on the other hand, is a risk factor, where racism is defined as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on race. Lastly, on this slide, we see that racism operates on many levels, including not only individual or personally mediated through discrimination and microaggressions, but also institutional through laws, policies, and practices that support the relative advantage or disadvantage of certain groups. And finally, internalized. Next, we'll look at some examples of these different types of racism, their historical antecedent, and current challenges. One example of institutional and personal racial bias involves medical experimentation. This is a statue recently removed from Central Park of Dr. Marion Sims, quote, the father of modern gynecology. Sims practiced medicine in the middle of the 19th century, a time when treating women was rarely done by male physicians. He was likely concerned with women's reproductive health as this was an important priority for plantation owners he served. After the prohibition of the international slave trade in 1808, reproduction was the unique way to replete supply. Sims pioneered the speculum, a tool used for pelvic exams. He also developed a surgical technique to repair the sicovaginal fistula, a painful complication that can happen in any childbirth, but is higher risk when the woman giving birth is very young. However, he perfected this technique practicing on three black women who were enslaved 
one of whom he operated on 30 plus times without anesthetic. This torture was potentially rationalized by the belief that black women did not feel pain as white women, as advanced by dyslexia Ethiopica. Unfortunately, these beliefs persist. A study in PNAS published in 2016 interviewed both a random sample of US adults and medical students. They found that nearly 50% of med students held some false belief about black people compared to 73% in the random sample. 9% of medical students and 20% of the non-medical sample endorsed the belief that the nerve endings of black patients were somehow less sensitive than white patients. These false beliefs translated into less treatment of pain for hypothetical black patients, as can be seen in panel B. Moving to real patients, a meta-analysis of 14 studies in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine found that compared to white patients, black patients were 40% less likely to receive medication to ease acute pain, and Hispanic patients were 25% less likely. In this example, we see how beliefs of physicians influenced by an institution that historically created false diagnoses to support the institution of slavery correlate with undertreatment of pain today and unequal ER experiences for black and white patients. Unfortunately, medical exploitation through experimentation was not limited to the antebellum period. Over a century after the end of the Civil War, details of the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, the official title of the study, were leaked to the press. The official title of the experiment tells you three things right off the bat. First, the study took place in Tuskegee, Alabama. Second, it involved patients with syphilis who were not to be treated. Third, the sample consisted entirely of black men. In the Tuskegee study, hundreds of adult black men were syphilis were passively monitored by the CDC for 40 years from 1932 to 1972. The men were deceived into thinking they were receiving treatment for quote, bad blood. In joint work with Marianne Wanamaker, we hypothesized that the 1972 disclosure amplified distrust of the medical system, affecting health-seeking behavior and health outcomes for those who most nearly identified with the deceived study subjects, i.e. Black men. We tested this hypothesis using an interactive triple differences framework, comparing differences across race and sex before versus after the study disclosure interacted with a measure of geographic proximity to the study site. We found that healthcare utilization dropped for black men and mortality rates rose for chronic diseases with no significant effects for acute causes of mortality, such as accidents. We also found that black men with a greater connection to Tuskegee exhibited significantly higher medical mistrust. Taken together, our results implied a decrease in Black adult male life expectancy, enough to explain about 35% of the overall racial gap in 1980. Terrible as experiments such as Tuskegee and those of Marion Sims are, a singular focus on these specific historical abuses can lead everyday indignities to be overlooked. As stated in a recent New England Journal of Medicine perspective piece by Dr. Fatima Stanford and Simara Singh Bajaj, quote, every day, Black Americans have their pain denied, conditions misdiagnosed, and necessary treatment withheld by physicians. In these moments, those patients are probably not historicizing their frustration by recalling Tuskegee, but rather contemplating how an institution sworn, sworn to do no harm has failed them. Indeed, evidence of everyday medical racism can be found in the 19th century. In an NBR working paper, Sherry Ali, Trevon Logan, and Boriana Milucheva show that physicians assessing civil war veterans for eligibility for disability were far more likely to reject the claims of Black friends. This figure shows descriptions from those surgeon reports. Black veterans were more than three times as likely to be accused of exaggerating their illness and 15 times more likely to be called ignorant. 
by leveraging the quasi-random assignment of veterans to physicians with varying levels of bias, the authors find that disparity in pension income resulting from physician bias in assessment explains nearly the entire gap in mortality between black and white Civil War veterans. Racial bias in medicine continues to this day. Scores of studies, many summarized in the 2003 Institute of Medicine's landmark report, Unequal Treatment, indicate that racial, quote, racial and ethnic minorities receive lower quality health care than white people, even when insurance status, income, age, and severity of conditions are comparable, quote. Yet the existence of bias in healthcare still has been doubted or denied at the highest levels of the medical community. A recent Journal of the American Medical Association or JAMA podcast was promoted with the tagline, quote, no physician is racist, so how can there be structural racism in healthcare, unquote. And the podcast featured a JAMA editor stating, quote, I think taking racism out of the conversation would help. Another example of institutional racism and its connections to health inequality today comes from the great migration and the backlash against black migrants. Pushed by the hostile environment of the Jim Crow South, including lynchings and pulled by more economic opportunities in the North, more than 6 million black Americans migrated from the rural South to Northern cities in the early 20th century. However, black migrants found themselves facing different forms of hostility and their economic gains came at a, at a cost. This table is from a 2015 American Economic Review paper by Dan Black and colleagues and shows that the movement north indeed brought substantial economic gains. For instance, among those men born in Georgia or South Carolina who moved northwards, their income increased by 18,214 2010 adjusted dollars off of a base of $26,684 or an increase of nearly 70%. There is a comparable rise in personal income and an important increase in education. Findings were similar for women and for black southerners from other states. However, the move northward also came with losses in terms of shorter lives. In the OLS estimates in column one top panel, living in the north was associated with a slight 0.3 percentage point increase in survival to 70 for men and no appreciable gains for women. However, there's selection bias in those estimates since the decision to migrate is not random. When instrumenting from the move northwards using birthplace proximity to a north-south railroad line, the IV estimate suggests that moving north was associated with a seven percentage point reduction in survival to age 70 for black men and a five percentage point reduction for black women. These findings are very interesting. Typically, according to our Grossman model, as incomes rise, there is a greater consumption of normal goods, including medical care, leading to health improvements. Preston's curve also shows a positive income health gradient. The authors report higher rates of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and cirrhosis among migrants than non-migrants, and view the evidence as potentially consistent with the possibility that increased smoking and drinking among migrants contributed to differential disease patterns. However, as black migrants arrived, the majority group responded in ways that could also contribute to poor health. Indeed, this slide shows that a high number of black Americans leaving the South for great migration cities in the left panel was similar I mean, to a rise in segregation in these receiving cities as shown in the right panel. The figure on the right is taken from David Cutler, Ed Glazer, and Jacob Vigdor, who in their 1999 Journal of Political Economy article found the sharp increase in residential segregation was in large part due to collective action taken by white people to exclude black people from their neighborhoods. As summarized in a recent social science and history article, quote, the increasing numbers frequently led to a backlash among the white population and growing efforts to isolate the black population economically, socially, and residentially. In addition to seminal work on the great migration by economic historians, Bill Collins, Bob Margo, Leo Bustan, to name but a few, Alora Duranacourt's recent job market paper revisits the response of these cities to black migrants 
She causally demonstrates in the panel on the right that northern urban destination locations that received a higher predicted share of Black migrants during the Great Migration saw an increase in resident, residential racial segregation, higher investments in police, and higher incarceration rates than destinations that received migrants. Note, most of these patterns did not exist prior to the 1940s, as shown in the panel on the left. The rise in segregation was aided by institutional racism codified into federal policy. Beginning in the 1930s, the Home Owners Corporation mapped over 200 cities at the relative risk of lending across neighborhoods. The maps were used by both the federal government, including the Veterans Administration and the Federal Housing Administration in the aftermath of World War II, as well as by private lenders to assess creditworthiness. Predominantly Black neighborhoods, however, were disproportionately assigned the lowest neighborhood grade of D, quote, hazardous, and colored red on the maps. As said by one appraiser, quote, colored infiltration, a definitely adverse influence on neighborhood desirability, unquote. This redlining of neighborhoods lowered property values and made it difficult for many Black Americans to purchase homes at reasonable interest rates and build wealth. The ramifications of redlining continue to this day. Suggestive evidence of the persistent health effects include two articles published by Nancy Krieger and colleagues last year, using data on the universe of infant births from New York City between 2013 and 2017. They find that the 1938 redlining zones correspond to a 1.6 greater odds of preterm birth and remain significant when adjusting for maternal characteristics and census tract poverty but not when controlling for segregation, which should suggest that may be the pathway. Emerging causal evidence exploiting variation from both neighborhood boundaries and a population size discontinuity with Daniel Aronson and colleagues indicates that redlining led to higher poverty and higher rates of teenage pregnancy, as well as more racial segregation. Redlining served to trap many Black Americans in segregated neighborhoods with limited economic opportunity. Segregation in general has been shown to be extremely bad for health. This review article for the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies by Thomas Levice, Daryl Gaskin, and Antonio Trujillo summarizes some of this important work. The researchers find that segregation predicts gaps in infant mortality between black and white babies. They also report one mechanism through which segregation is potentially operating is via the concentration of extreme poverty. Place-based attributes associated with extreme poverty include but are not limited to fewer green spaces, more environmental hazards, and lower quality infrastructure. Another example of structural racism related to the Great Migration is mass incarceration. In response to the Third Amendment, which freed all those enslaved and prohibited slavery and bondage, with the exception of as punishment for a crime, Southern legislators created new laws that led to lengthy sentences for minor and non-existent crimes, such as vagrancy. These laws served to prevent outmigration of black men and encourage convict leasing, thus guaranteeing Southern planters a reliable supply of low wage labor. Migration northward, as we have seen from Allura's work, also led to greater investment in policing and incarceration. Today, black men are nearly six times more likely to be in prison than white men. And on any given day, a tenth of black children have a parent who's in jail or prison. Mass incarceration affects not just those who are incarcerated in their families, but also many more in the community. This figure from a Lancet Review article shows the plausible linkages between correctional and community health. Starting from the left-hand side, mass incarceration concentrates individuals, many of whom already have poor health status or at, at high risk for infectious disease, for instance, by criminalizing injection drug use or commercial sex. Correctional facilities can then amplify adverse health conditions through overcrowding, poor physical infrastructure, and restricted access to healthcare services. Networks formed in the facility, as well as malnutrition and poor ventilation can further the spread of disease. More than 95% of incarcerated individuals eventually re-enter the general community, 
posing the risk of dissemination. A study exemplifying this for the case of HIV AIDS written by Rucker Johnson and Steve Raff Raphael can be found in the Journal of Law and Economics. And there is more recent studies showing the same phenomenon with respect to COVID-19. Links between the criminal justice and health system go beyond incarceration or infectious disease. In a Lancet study by Jacob Bohr and colleagues, the authors use a difference in differences specification, finding that Black Americans exposed to one or more police killings of unarmed Black people in their state of residence in the past three months reported significantly more poor mental health days. This is in the panel on the left. Further, a recent article in the Quarterly Journal of Economics by Desmond Eng in the right panel find similar results using detailed data on officer-involved killings and student outcomes in Los Angeles. Exposure to violence resulted in significant increases in emotional distance, which persisted for six semesters and was accompanied by declines in student GPA, high school completion, and college enrollment. Unequal treatment across many dimensions of society, from the criminal justice system to the healthcare system, in the workplace, in education, in everyday encounters, could be a contributing factor to racial health inequality. A growing body of evidence indicates that self-reported experiences of discrimination are significantly associated with poor health outcomes. In a pair of studies, Emory University epidemiologist Tenny Lewis and colleagues found that self-reported experiences of racial discrimination are significantly associated with higher levels of C-reactive protein, a marker of inflammation, as well as coronary artery calcification among Black adults. These associations remained robust to adjustment for demographics and other risk factors. Exposure to discrimination has also been shown to be associated with dysregulation in cortisol, carotid and media thickness, and elevated blood pressure. The wear and tear, or weathering, as Arlene Geronimus calls it, on the body from the stress of discrimination may lead to accelerated aging in Black compared to white Americans. This evidence base is still evolving, provides a pathway back to the opposite direction, the social construct of race in and unequal health outcomes instead of innate biological differences leading to different social outcomes. Now I'm gonna switch gears and offer some thoughts on the role of diversity as well as propose some potential avenues for research for health economists. One suggestion for helping to close racial health gaps put by the Association of American Medical Colleges, the AAMC, the American Medical Association, the AMA, and the National Academies of Medicine, the NAM, is to increase the diversity of the healthcare work more nearly represent the population it's trying to serve. Work authored with Dr. Owen Garrick and Grant Graziani, we sought to empirically test the effectiveness of this recommendation. Specifically, we tested whether Black men would increase their take up of preventative care when randomly assigned to a Black male doctor. To do so, we set up a pop up medical clinic in Oakland and recruited Black men from low barber shops. We hired 14 physicians and approximately 25 field and clinic staff. In the interest of time, let me jump to the punchline. Black patients randomly assigned to Black male doctors were much more likely to demand every preventative service once they had a chance to actually speak with their assigned doctor in person. And this was particularly true for invasive services that required just a finger prick of blood for a diabetes or a cholesterol screening test for a flu vaccine injection. The effects were large on the order of 20 to 27 percentage points or 60 to 75%. The findings of this RCT coupled with important quasi-experimental research provide support for the policy goal of increasing diversity physician workforce. In the Oakland experiment, half of our clinic's doctors were black by design. However, only about 1% of US physicians are black, although Africans comprise 12% of the US population. Similar levels of underrepresentation exist among medical school faculty, about 3 to 
and the share of Black medical graduates has remained constant at 6% over the last two decades. According to Nancy, fewer Black men matriculated to medical school in 2015, only 515, than in 1978 when 542 matriculated. Similar issues exist in the economics profession. Last year's AEA report on the staff minority groups in economics indicates that the Black share of total economic degrees awarded was substantially lower in 2019 than it was in 1995. This decline occurred even as Black representation in STEM and other subjects rose during that same time period. Among economic PhDs granted to US citizen and permanent residents in 2018 and 2019, just 2.8% or 13 total were awarded to Black Americans. Hispanics were also underrepresented and not a single Native American in the US received an economics PhD that year. Diversity does not just encompass personnel, but also the type of research that is published. This table is taken from Health Affairs and shows that the amount of research on racism in leading medical journals is extremely low. In the 30 years between 1990 and 2020, there were just four empirical studies, including the word racism in the New England Journal of Medicine, 11 in 20 in and 29 in Lancet. The amount of perspective pieces numbered about 1,000. Those four medicals published around 225,000 articles in that same time period. A similar situation exists in economics. In a recent Fox article, a group of economists found that the share of economic publications that are race related has remained stagnant at less than 2% for nearly the past five decades. By comparison, other social sciences such as political science and sociology devote a far higher share of their scholarship to issues involving race and have seen that share rise in recent years. Furthermore, it appears that economists were not aware of these facts. The study's authors conducted a survey of economists and asked them about their beliefs about the share of race-related research in economics as well as in other disciplines. Although economists correctly predicted that economics published less than political science or sociology, the median economist survey believed that the share of race-related research in economics was four times higher than it actually was. A complex and challenging issue such as racial health inequality opens the door for important and interesting research contributions from all types of economists. And I wanna acknowledge in this that there are some working already on these issues. For theorists, I think the challenge is to make economic models of discrimination richer, as Marty alluded to yesterday as well, to include more of the perspective of disadvantaged groups, to incorporate the consideration of institutions determining the initial allocations and the interaction of individuals and institutions to perpetuate racism, as well as describe motives for, for persistent prejudice belief. For econometrician, there are continued challenges of representativeness, including understanding and improving unit and item non-responsive survey data, detecting and correcting for the effect of churn and censoring of vulnerable populations in commonly used claims in our data. Also, how should we estimate the effects of discrimination occurring at these multiple levels, i.e. individual institutions? And we need guidance on the right scale for place-based effects. For applied economists, there are many open questions. One that seems promising is whether it is possible to design and incentivize equity benchmarks for payers and providers, as well as a deeper understanding of how insurance and medical care interact with other systems, such as the educational system and the criminal justice system to worsen or improve health. Lastly, it would be great if we could socialize and that research on health Inequality is serious scholarship that merits funding, professorships, and real estate among leading journals in both disciplines. I'd like to leave you with this quote from Damon Tweedy, professor from Duke University and a psychiatrist. Dr. Tweedy is the author of the memoir, Black Man in a White Coat, and writes, quote, when I started medical school and learned about the health outcomes that afflicted Black people, I'd assume these differences were chiefly due to genetics. To be sure, there are diseases such as sickle cell anemia, lupus, and sarcoid, which appear to preferentially target black patients at a biological level. 
But what had become abundantly clear during my years in medical school and as a doctor, however, were the many ways that social and economic factors influence health and more than, any other, and more than anything else account for the sickness and suffering I have seen, unquote. Given Dr. Tweedy's comments, economists should feel well equipped to contribute to research on this topic, since as he states, the problems are more socioeconomic than biologic in nature. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. And I just thought I would put these additional resources um, on that last slide. 